Emma by Jane Austen, Chapter Eleven. Mr. Elton must now be left to himself. It was no longer in Emma's power to superintend his happiness or quicken his measures. The coming of her sister's family was so very near at hand that first in anticipation and then in reality it became henceforth her prime object of interest. And during the ten days of their stay in Hartfield, it was not to be expected, she did not herself expect, that anything beyond occasional fortuitous assistance could be afforded by her to the lovers. They might advance rapidly if they would, however, they must advance somehow or other, whether they would or no. She hardly wished to have more leisure for them. There are people who the more you do for them, the less they will do for themselves. Mr. and Mrs. John Knightley, from having been longer than usual absent from Surrey, were excited, of course, rather more than the usual interest. Till this year every long vacation since their marriage had been divided between Hartfield and Donwell Abbey. But all the holidays of this autumn had been given to sea-bathing for the children, and it was therefore many months since they had been seen in a regular way by their Surrey connections, or seen at all by Mr. Woodhouse, who could not be induced to get so far as London, even for poor Isabella's sake, and who consequently was now most nervously and apprehensively happy in forestalling this too short visit. He thought much of the evils of the journey for her, and not a little of the fatigues of his own horses and coachmen, who were to bring them some of the party the last half of the way. But his alarms were needless, the sixteen miles being happily accomplished, and Mr. and Mrs. John Knightley, their five children, and a competent number of nursery-maids, all reaching Hartfield in safety. The bustle and joy of such an arrival, the many to be talked to, welcomed, encouraged, and variously dispersed and disposed of, produced a noise and confusion which his nerves could not have borne under any other cause, nor have endured much longer even for this. But the ways of Hartfield and the feelings of her father were so respected by Mrs. John Knightley that in spite of maternal solicitude for the immediate enjoyment of her little ones, and for their having instantly all the liberty and attendance, all the eating and drinking and sleeping and playing, which they could possibly wish for, without the smallest delay the children were never allowed to be long a disturbance to him, either in themselves or in any restless attendance on them. Mrs. John Knightley was a pretty, elegant little woman, of gentle, quiet manners, and a disposition remarkably amiable and affectionate, wrapped up in her family. A devoted wife, a doting mother, and so tenderly attached to her father and sister, that but for these higher ties a warmer love might have seemed impossible. She could never see a fault in any of them. She was not a woman of strong understanding, or any quickness, and with this resemblance of her father she inherited also much of his constitution, was delicate in her own health, over-careful of that of her children, had many fears and many nerves, and was as fond of her own Mr. Wingfield in town as her father could be of Mr. Perry. They were alike, too, in a general benevolence of temper and a strong habit of regard for every old acquaintance. Mr. John Knightley was a tall, gentleman-like, and very clever man, riding in his profession domestic and respectable in his private character, but with reserved manners which prevented his being generally pleasing, and capable of being sometimes out of humour. He was not an ill-tempered man, not so often unreasonably cross as to deserve such a reproach, but his temper was not his great perfection, and indeed with such a worshipping wife it was hardly possible that any natural defects in it should not be increased. 
the extreme sweetness of her temper must hurt his. He had all the clearness and quickness of mind which she wanted, and he could sometimes act an ungracious or say a severe thing. He was not a great favorite with his fair sister-in-law. Nothing wrong in him escaped her. She was quick in feeling the little injuries to Isabella, which Isabella never felt herself. Perhaps she might have passed over more had his manners been flattering to Isabella's sister, but they were only those of a calmly kind brother and friend, without praise and without blindness, but hardly any degree of personal compliment could have made her regardless of that greatest fault in all in her eyes which he sometimes fell into, the want of respectful forbearance towards her father. There he had not always the patience that could have been wished. Mr. Woodhouse's peculiarities and fidgetiness were sometimes provoking him to a rational remonstrance or sharp retort equally ill-bestowed. It did not often happen, for Mr. John Knightley had really a great regard for his father-in-law, and generally a strong sense of what was due to him. But it was too often for Emma's charity, especially as there was all the pain of apprehension frequently to be endured, though the offence came not. The beginning, however, of every visit displayed none but the properest feelings, and this being of necessity so short might be hoped to pass away in unsullied cordiality. They had not been long seated and composed when Mr. Woodhouse, with a melancholy shake of the head and a sigh, called his daughter's attention to the sad change at Hartfield since she had been there last. "'Ah, my dear,' said he, "'poor Miss Taylor. "'Oh, yes, sir,' cried she, with ready sympathy, "'how you must miss her, and dear Emma, too. "'What a dreadful loss to you both! "'I have been so grieved for you. "'It could not imagine how you could possibly do without her. "'It is a sad change indeed, but I hope she is pretty well, sir.' "'Pretty well, my dear. I hope pretty well. I do not know but that the place agrees with her tolerably.' Mr. John Knightley here asked Emma quietly whether there were any doubts of the heir of Randall's. "'Oh, no, none in the least. I never saw Mrs. Weston better in my life, never looking so well. Papa is only speaking his own regret.' "'Very much to the honour of both,' was the handsome reply. "'And do you see her, sir, tolerably often?' asked Isabella in the plaintive tone which just suited her father. Mr. Woodhouse hesitated. "'Not near so often, my dear, as I could wish.' "'Oh, papa, we have missed seeing them but one entire day since they married, either in the morning or evening of every day, excepting one—' Have we seen either Mr. Weston or Mrs. Weston, and generally both, either at Randall's or here, and as you may suppose, Isabella, most frequently here? They are very, very kind in their visits. Mr. Weston is really as kind as herself. Papa, if you speak in that melancholy way, you will be giving Isabella a false idea of us all. Everybody must be aware that Miss Taylor must be missed. But everybody ought also to be assured that Mr. and Mrs. Weston do really prevent our missing her by any means to the extent we ourselves anticipated, which is the exact truth. Just as it should be, said Mr. John Knightley, and just as I hoped it was from your letters, her wish of showing you attention could not be doubted, and his being a disengaged and social man makes it all easy. I have been always telling you, my love, that I had no idea of the change being so very material to Hartfield as you apprehended, and now you have Emma's account. I hope you will be satisfied. Why, to be sure, said Mr. Woodhouse, yes, certainly, I cannot deny that Mrs. Weston, poor Mrs. Weston, does come and see us pretty often, but then she is always obliged to go away again. It would be very hard upon Mr. Weston if she did not, Papa. You quite forget poor Mr. Weston. 
"'I think indeed,' said John Knightley pleasantly, "'that Mr. Weston has some little claim. "'You and I, Emma, will venture to take the part of the poor husband. "'I being a husband, and you not being a wife, "'the claims of the man may very likely strike us with equal force. "'As for Isabella, she has been married long enough to see the convenience "'of putting all the Mr. Westons aside as much as she can.' me my love cried his wife hearing and understanding only in part are you talking about me i am sure nobody ought to be or can be a greater advocate for matrimony than i am and if it had not been for the misery of her leaving hartfield i should never have thought of miss taylor but as the most fortunate woman in the world and as to slighting mr weston that excellent mr weston i think there is nothing he does not deserve i believe he is one of the very best-tempered men ever existed excepting yourself and your brother i do not know his equal for temper i shall never forget his flying henry's kite for him that very windy day last easter and ever since his particular kindness last september twelfth month in writing that note at twelve o'clock at night on purpose to assure me that there was no scarlet fever at cobham i have been convinced there could not be a more feeling heart nor a better man in existence if anybody can deserve him it must be miss taylor where is the young man said mr john knightley has he been here on this occasion or has he not he has not been here yet replied emma there was a strong expectation of his coming soon after the marriage but it ended in nothing and i have not heard him mentioned lately but you should tell them of the letter my dear said her father he wrote a letter to poor mrs weston to congratulate her and a very proper handsome letter it was she showed it to me i thought it very well done of him indeed whether it was his own idea you know one cannot tell he is but young and his uncle perhaps my dear papa he is three and twenty you forget how time passes three and twenty is he indeed well i could not have thought it and he was but two years old when he lost his poor mother well time does fly indeed and my memory is very bad however it was an exceedingly good letter and gave mr and mrs weston a great deal of pleasure i remember it was written from weymouth and dated september twenty eighth and began my dear madame but i forget how it went on and it was signed f c weston churchill i remember that perfectly how very pleasing and proper of him cried the good-hearted mrs john knightley i have no doubt of his being a most amiable young man but how sad it is that he should not live at home with his father there is something so shocking in a child's being taken away from his parents and natural home i could never comprehend how mr weston could part with him to give up one's child i really never could think well of anybody who proposed such a thing to anybody else nobody ever did think well of the churchills i fancy observed mr john knightley coolly but you need not imagine mr weston to have felt what you would feel in giving up henry or john mr weston is rather an easy cheerful tempered man than a man of strong feelings he takes things as he finds them and makes enjoyment of them somehow or other depending i suspect much more upon what is called society for his comforts that is upon the power of eating and drinking and playing whist with his neighbours five times a week than upon family affection or anything that home affords emma could not like what bordered on a reflection on mr weston and half a mind to take it up but she struggled and let it pass she would keep the peace if possible and there was something honourable and valuable in the strong domestic habits the all-sufficiency of home to himself whence resulted her brother's disposition to look down on the common rate of social intercourse and those to whom it was important it had a high claim to forbearance
End of chapter 11 Emma by Jane Austen Chapter 12 Mr. Knightley was to dine with them, rather against the inclination of Mr. Woodhouse, who did not like that any one should share with him in Isabella's first day. Emma's sense of right, however, had decided it, and besides the consideration of what was due to each brother, she had particular pleasure from the circumstance of the late disagreement between Mr. Knightley and herself in procuring him the proper invitation. She hoped they might now become friends again. She thought it was time to make up. Making up indeed would not do. She certainly had not been in the wrong, and he would never own that he had. Concession must be out of the question, but it was time to appear to forget that they had ever quarrelled, and she hoped it might rather assist the restoration of friendship, that when he came into the room she had one of the children with her, the youngest, a nice little girl about eight months old, who was now making her first visit to Hartfield, and very happy to be danced about in her aunt's arms. It did assist, for though he began with grave looks and short questions, he was soon led on to talk of them all in the usual way, and to take the child out of her arms with all the unceremoniousness of perfect amity. Emma felt they were friends again, and the conviction giving her at first great satisfaction, and then a little sauciness, she could not help saying as he was admiring the baby. What a comfort it is, that we think alike about our nephews and nieces! As to men and women, our opinions are sometimes very different, but with regard to these children, I observe we never disagree. If you were as much guided by nature in your estimate of men and women, and as little under the power of fancy and whim in your dealings with them as you are where these children are concerned, we might always think alike. Yes, said he, smiling, and reason good. I was sixteen years old when you were born. A material difference, then, she replied, and no doubt you were much my superior in judgment at that period of our lives. But does not the lapse of one and twenty years bring our understandings a good deal nearer? Yes, a good deal nearer but still not near enough to give me a chance of being right if we think differently? I have still the advantage of you by sixteen years' experience, and by not being a pretty young woman and a spoiled child. Come, my dear Emma, let us be friends, and say no more about it. Tell your aunt, little Emma, that she ought to set you a better example than to be renewing old grievances, and that if she were not wrong before, she is now. That's true, she cried, very true. Little Emma, grow up a better woman than your aunt, but infinitely cleverer, and not half so conceited. Now, Mr. Knightley, a word or two more, and I have done. As far as good intentions went, we were both right, and I must say that no effects on my side of the argument have yet proved wrong. I only want to know that Mr. Martin is not very, very bitterly disappointed. A man cannot be more so, was his short, full answer. Ah, indeed, I am very sorry. Come, shake hands with me. This had just taken place, and with great cordiality, when John Knightley made his appearance. "'How do you do, George?' said Mr. John Knightley. "'John, how are you?' succeeded in the true English style, bearing under a calmness which seemed all but indifference, the real attachment which would have led either of them, if requisite, to do everything for the good of the other.' The evening was quiet and conversable, and Mr. Woodhouse declined cards entirely for the sake of comfortable talk with his dear Isabella, and the little party made two natural divisions, on one side he and his daughter, on the other the two Mr. Knightleys, their subjects totally distinct, or very rarely mixing, and Emma only occasionally joining in one or the other. The brothers talked of their own concerns and pursuits, 
but principally on those of the elder whose temper was by much the most communicative and who was always the greater talker as a magistrate he had generally some point of law to consult john about or at least some curious anecdote to give and as a farmer as keeping in hand the home farm at donwell he had to tell what every field was to bear next year and to give all such local information as could not fail of being interesting to a brother whose home it had equally been the longest part of his life and whose attachments were strong the plan of a drain the change of a fence the felling of a tree and the destination of every acre for wheat turnips or spring corn was entered into with as much equality of interest by john as his cooler manners rendered possible and if his willing brother ever left him anything to inquire about his inquiries even approached a tone of eagerness while they were thus comfortably occupied mr woodhouse was enjoying a full flow of happy regrets and fearful affection with his daughter my poor dear isabella said he fondly shaking her hand and interrupting for a few moments her busy labours for some one of her five children how long it is how terrible long since you were here and how tired you must be after your journey you must go to bed early my dear and i recommend a little gruel to you before you go and i will have a nice basin of gruel together my dear emma suppose we all have a little gruel emma could not suppose any such thing knowing as she did that both the mr knightleys were as unpersuadable on that article as herself and two basins only were ordered after a little more discourse in praise of gruel with some wondering as its not being taken every evening by everybody he proceeded to say with an air of grave reflection it was an awkward business my dear your spending the autumn at south end instead of coming here i never had much opinion of the sea air mr wingfield most strenuously recommended it sir or we should not have gone he recommended it for all the children but particularly for the weakness in little bella's throat both sea air and bathing ah my dear but perry had many doubts about the sea doing her any good and as to myself i have been long perfectly convinced though perhaps i never told you so before that the sea is very rarely of use to anybody i am sure it almost killed me once come come cried emma feeling this to be an unsafe subject i must beg you not to talk of the sea it makes me envious and miserable i have never seen it south end is prohibited if you please my dear isabella i have not heard you make one inquiry about mr perry yet and he never forgets you oh good mr perry how is he sir why pretty well but not quite well poor perry is bilious and he has not time to take care of himself he tells me he has not time to take care of himself which is very sad but he is always wanted all round country i suppose there is not a man in such practice anywhere but there is not so clever a man anywhere and mrs perry and the children how are they do the children grow i have a great regard for mr perry i hope he will be calling soon he will be so pleased to see my little ones i hope he will be here to-morrow for i have a question or two to ask him about myself of some consequence and my dear whenever he comes you had better let him take a look at little bella's throat oh my dear sir her throat is so much better that i have hardly any uneasiness about it either bathing has been of the greatest service to her or else it is to be attributed to an excellent embrocation of mr wingfield's which we have been applying at times ever since august it is not very likely my dear that bathing should have been of use to her and if i had known you were wanting in embrocation i would have spoken to 
"'You seem to me to have forgotten Mrs. and Miss Bates,' said Emma. "'I have not heard one inquiry after them.' "'Oh, the good Bateses! I am quite ashamed of myself, but you mention them in most of your letters. I hope they are quite well. Good old Mrs. Bates! I will call upon her to-morrow, and take my children. They are always so pleased to see my children, and that excellent Miss Bates! Such thoroughly worthy people! How are they, sir? Well, pretty well, my dear, upon the whole. Poor Mrs. Bates had a bad cold about a month ago. How sorry I am! But colds were never so prevalent as they have been this autumn. Mr. Wingfield told me that he has never known them more general or heavy, except when it has been quite an influenza. That has been a good deal the case, my dear, but not to the degree you mention. Perry says that colds have been very general, but not so heavy as he has very often known them in November. Perry does not call it altogether a sickly season. No, I do not know that Mr. Wingfield considers it very sickly, except— Ah, my poor dear child, the truth is that in London it is always a sickly season. Nobody is healthy in London. Nobody can be. It is a dreadful thing to have you forced to live there, so far off, and the air so bad. No, indeed, we are not at all in a bad air. Our part of London is very superior to most others. You must not confound us with London in general, my dear sir. The neighbourhood of Brunswick Square is very different from almost all the rest. We are so very airy. I should be unwilling, I own, to live in any other part of the town. There is hardly any other that I could be satisfied to have my children in. But we are so remarkably airy. Mr. Wingfield thinks the vicinity of Brunswick Square decidedly the most favourable as to air. Ah, my dear, it is not like Hartfield. You make the best of it, but after you have been a week at Hartfield, you are all of you different creatures. You do not look like the same. Now I cannot say that I think any of you are looking well at present. I am sorry to hear you say so, sir, but I assure you, excepting those little nervous headaches and palpitations, which I am never entirely free from anywhere, I am quite well myself, and if the children were rather pale before they went to bed, it was only because they were a little more tired than usual from their journey and the happiness of coming. I hope you will think better of their looks to-morrow, for I assure you Mr. Wingfield told me that he did not believe he had ever sent us off altogether in such good case. I trust at least that you do not think Mr. Knightley looking ill, turning her eyes with affectionate anxiety towards her husband. Middling, my dear, I cannot compliment you. I think Mr. John Knightley very far from looking well. "'What is the matter, sir? Did you speak to me?' cried Mr. John Knightley, hearing his own name. "'I am sorry to find, my love, that my father does not think you looking well, but I hope it is only from being a little fatigued. "'I could have wished, however, as you know, that you had seen Mr. Wingfield before you left home.' "'My dear Isabella,' claimed he hastily, "'pray do not concern yourself with my looks.' Be satisfied with doctoring and coddling yourself and the children, and let me look as I choose. I did not thoroughly understand what you were telling your brother, cried Emma, about your friend Mr. Graham's attending to have a bailiff from Scotland to look after his new estate. What will it answer? Will not the old prejudice be too strong? And she talked in this way so long and successfully that when forced to give her attention again to her father and sister, she had nothing worse to hear than Isabella's kind inquiry after Jane Fairfax. And Jane Fairfax, though no great favourite with her in general, she was at that moment very happy to assist in praising. "'That sweet, amiable Jane Fairfax,' said Mrs. John Knightley, 
it is so long since i have seen her except now and then for a moment accidentally in town what happiness it must be to her good old grandmother and excellent aunt when she comes to visit them i always regret excessively on dear emma's account that she cannot be more at highbury but now their daughter is married i suppose colonel and mrs campbell will not be able to part with her at all she would be such a delightful companion for emma mr woodhouse agreed to it all but added our little friend harriet smith however is just such another pretty kind of young person you will like harriet emma could not have a better companion than harriet i am most happy to hear it but only jane fairfax one knows to be so very accomplished and superior and exactly emma's age this topic was discussed very happily and others succeeded of similar moment and passed away with similar harmony but the evening did not close without a little return of agitation the gruel came and supplied a great deal to be said much praise and many comments undoubting decisions of its wholesomeness for every constitution and pretty severe philippics upon the many houses where it was never met with tolerable but unfortunately among the failures which the daughter had to instance the most recent and therefore most prominent was in her own cook at south end a young woman hired for the same time who never had been able to understand what she meant by a basin of nice smooth gruel thin but not too thin often as she had wished for and ordered it she had never been able to get anything tolerable here was a dangerous opening ah said mr woodhouse shaking his head and fixing his eyes on her with tender concern the ejaculation in emma's ear expressed ah there is no end of sad consequences of your going to south end it does not bear talking of and for a little while she hoped he would not talk of it but then a silent rumination might suffice to restore him to the relish of his own smooth gruel after an interval of some minutes however he began with i shall always be very sorry that you went to the sea this autumn instead of coming here but why should you be sorry sir i assure you it did the children a great deal of good and moreover if you must go to the sea it had better not have been to south end south end is an unhealthy place perry was surprised to hear you had fixed upon south end i know there is such an idea with many people but indeed it is quite a mistake sir we all had our health perfectly well there never found the least inconvenience from the mud and mr wingfield says it is entirely a mistake to suppose the place unhealthy and i am sure he may be depended on for he thoroughly understands the nature of the air and his own brother and family have been there repeatedly you should have gone to cromer my dear if you went anywhere perry was a week at calmer once and he holds it to be the best of all the sea-bathing places a fine open sea he says and very pure air and by what i understand you might have had lodgings there quite away from the sea a quarter of a mile off very comfortable you should have consulted perry but my dear sir the difference of the journey only consider how great it would have been a hundred miles perhaps instead of forty ah my dear as perry says where health is at stake nothing else should be considered and if one is to travel there is not much to choose between forty miles and a hundred better not move at all better stay in london altogether than travel forty miles to get into worse air this is just what perry said it seemed to him a very ill-judged measure emma's attempts to stop her father had been in vain and when he had reached such a point as this she could not wonder at her brother-in-law's breaking out mr perry said he in a voice of very strong displeasure would do well to keep his opinion till it is asked for 
why does he make it any business of his to wonder at what I do, at my taking my family to one part of the coast or another? I may be allowed, I hope, the use of my judgment as well as Mr. Perry. I want his directions no more than his drugs. He paused, and growing cooler in a moment, added, with only sarcastic dryness, If Mr. Perry can tell me how to convey a wife and five children a distance of a hundred and thirty miles, with no greater expense or inconvenience than a distance of forty, I should be as willing to prefer Comer to South End as he could himself. "'True, true,' cried Mr. Knightley, with the most ready interposition. "'Very true. That's a consideration, indeed. But, John, as to what I was telling you of my idea of moving the path to Langham, to turning it more to the right that it may not cut through the home meadows, I cannot conceive any difficulty. I should not attempt it, if it were to be the means of inconvenience to the Highbury people, but if you call to mind exactly the present line of the path, the only way of proving it, however, will be to turn to our maps. I shall see you at the abbey to-morrow morning, I hope, and then we shall look them over, and you shall give me your opinion. Mr. Woodhouse was rather agitated by such harsh reflections on his friend Perry, to whom he had, in fact, though unconsciously, been attributing many of his own feelings and expressions, but the soothing attentions of his daughters gradually removed the present evil, and the other immediate alertness of one brother, and better recollections of the other, prevented any renewal of it. End of chapter 12 Emma by Jane Austen Chapter 13 there could hardly be a happier creature in the world than Mrs. John Knightley, in this short visit to Hartfield, going about every morning among her old acquaintances with her five children, and talking over what she had done every evening with her father and sister. She had nothing to wish otherwise, but that the days did not pass too swiftly. It was a delightful visit, perfect in being much too short." In general their evenings were less engaged with friends than their mornings, but one complete dinner engagement, and out of the house too, there was no avoiding, though at Christmas. Mr. Weston would take no denial. They must all dine at Randall's one day. Even Mr. Woodhouse was persuaded to think it a possible thing in preference to a division of the party. How they were all to be conveyed, he would have made a difficulty if he could, but as soon as his son and daughter's carriage and horses were actually at Hartfield, he was not able to make more than a simple question on that head. It hardly amounted to a doubt, nor did it occupy Emma long to convince him that there might in one of the carriages find room for Harriet also. Harriet, Mr. Elton, and Mr. Knightley, their own especial set, were the only persons invited to meet them. The hours were to be early as well as the numbers few, Mr. Woodhouse's habits and inclination being consulted in everything. The evening before this great event, for it was a very great event that Mr. Woodhouse should dine out on the 24th of December, had been spent by Harriet at Hartfield, and she had gone home so much indisposed with a cold that but for her own earnest wish of being nursed by Mrs. Goddard, Emma could not have allowed her to leave the house. Emma called on her the next day, and found her doom already signed with regard to Randall's. She was very feverish, and had a bad sore throat. Mrs. Goddard was full of care and affection, Mr. Perry was talked of, and Harriet herself was too ill and low to resist the authority which excluded her from this delightful engagement, though she could not speak of her loss without many tears. Emma sat with her as long as she could, to attend her in Mrs. Goddard's unavoidable absences, and raise her spirits by representing how much Mr. Elton's would be depressed when he knew her state, 
and left her at last tolerably comfortable, in the sweet dependence of his having a most comfortless visit, and of their all missing her very much. She had not advanced many yards from Mrs. Goddard's door, when she was met by Mr. Elton himself, evidently coming towards it, and as they walked on slowly together in conversation about the invalid, of whom he, on the rumour of considerable illness, had been going to inquire, that he might carry some report of her to Hartfield, they were overtaken by Mr. John Knightley, returning from the daily visit to Donwell with his two eldest boys, whose healthy glowing faces showed all the benefit of a country run, and seemed to ensure a quick dispatch of the roast mutton and rice pudding they were hastening home for. They joined company and proceeded together. Emma was just describing the nature of her friend's complaint. A throat very much inflamed, with a great deal of heat about her, a quick, low pulse, and etc. And she was sorry to find from Mrs. Goddard that Harriet was liable to very bad sore throats, and had often alarmed her with them. Mr. Elton looked all alarm on the occasion as he exclaimed, "'A sore throat! I hope not infectious! I hope not of a putrid infectious sort! Has Perry seen her? Indeed, you should take care of yourself as well as your friend. Let me entreat you to run no risks. Why does not Perry see her?' Emma, who was not really at all frightened herself, tranquillized this excess of apprehension of assurances of Mrs. Goddard's experience and care. But, as there must still remain a degree of uneasiness which she could not wish to reason away, which she would rather feed and assist than not, she added soon afterwards, as if quite another subject, "'It is so cold!' so very cold, and looks and feels so very much like snow, that if it were to any other place, or with any other party, I should really try not to go out to-day, and dissuade my father from venturing. But as he has made up his mind, and does not seem to feel the cold himself, I do not like to interfere, as I know it would be so great a disappointment to Mr. and Mrs. Weston." But upon my word, Mr. Elton, in your case, I should certainly excuse myself. You appear to me a little hoarse already, and when you consider what demand of voice and fatigues to-morrow will bring, I think it would be no more than common prudence to stay at home and take care of yourself to-night. Mr. Elton looked as if he did not know very well how to answer, which was exactly the case, for though very much gratified by the kind care of such a fair lady, and not liking to resist any advice of hers, he had not really the least inclination to give up the visit. But Emma, too eager and busy in her own previous conceptions and views to hear him impartially, or to see him with clear vision, was very well satisfied with his muttering acknowledgment of its being very cold, certainly, very cold, and walked on, rejoicing in having extricated him from Randall's, and secured him the power of sending to inquire after Harriet every hour of the evening. "'You do quite right,' said she. "'We will make your apologies to Mr. and Mrs. Weston.' But hardly had she so spoken when she found her brother was civilly offering a seat in his carriage if the weather were Mr. Elton's only objection, and Mr. Elton actually accepted the offer with much prompt satisfaction. It was a done thing. Mr. Elton was to go, and never had his broad, handsome face expressed more pleasure than at this moment. Never had his smile been stronger, nor his eyes more exulting, than when he next looked at her. Well, said she to herself, this is most strange. After I had got him off so well, to choose to go into company, and leave Harriet ill behind? Most strange, indeed. But there it is. I believe in many men, especially single men, such an inclination, such a passion for dining out, 
A dinner engagement is so high in the class of their pleasures, their enjoyments, their dignities, almost their duties, that anything gives way to it, and this must be the case with Mr. Elton. A most valuable, amiable, pleasing young man, undoubtedly, and very much in love with Harriet, but still he cannot refuse an invitation. He must dine out wherever he is asked. What a strange thing love is! He can see ready wit in Harriet, but will not dine alone for her. Soon afterwards Mr. Elton quitted them, and she could not but do him the justice of feeling that there was a great deal of sentiment in his manner of naming Harriet at parting. In the tone of his voice, while assuring her that he should call at Mrs. Goddard's for news of her fair friend, the last thing before he prepared for the happiness of meeting her again, when he hoped to be able to give a better report, and he sighed and smiled himself off in a way that left the balance of approbation much in his favour. After a few minutes of entire silence between them, John Knightley began with, "'I never in my life saw a man more intent on being agreeable than Mr. Elton. It is downright labour to him where ladies are concerned. With men he can be rational and unaffected, but when he has ladies to please, every feature works mr elton's manners are not perfect replied emma but where there is a wish to please one ought to overlook and one does overlook a great deal where a man does his best with only moderate powers he will have the advantage over negligent superiority there is such perfect good temper and good will in mr elton as one cannot but value Yes, said Mr. John Knightley presently, with some slyness. He seems to have a great deal of good will towards you. Me, she replied with a smile of astonishment. Are you imagining me to be Mr. Elton's object? Such an imagination has crossed me, I own, Emma. And if it never occurred to you before, you may as well take it into consideration now. Mr. Elton in love with me? What an idea! I do not say it is so, but you will do well to consider whether it is or not, and to regulate your behaviour accordingly. I think your manners to him encouraging. I speak as a friend, Emma. You had better look about you and ascertain what you do and what you mean to do. I thank you, but I assure you you are quite mistaken. Mr. Elton and I are very good friends, and nothing more. And she walked on, amusing herself in the consideration of the blunders which often arise from a partial knowledge of circumstances, of the mistakes which people of high pretensions to judgment are for ever falling into, and not very well pleased with her brother for imagining her blind and ignorant, and in want of counsel. He said no more. Mr. Woodhouse had so completely made up his mind to the visit that in spite of the increasing coldness he seemed to have no idea of shrinking from it, and set forward at last most punctually with his eldest daughter in his own carriage, with less apparent consciousness of the weather than either of the others, too full of the wonder of his own going and the pleasure it was going to afford at randall's to see that it was cold and too well wrapped up to feel it the cold however was severe and by the time the second carriage was in motion a few flakes of snow were finding their way down and the sky had the appearance of being so overcharged as to want only a milder air to produce a very white world in a very short time emma soon saw that her companion was not in the happiest humour the preparing and the going abroad in such weather with the sacrifice of his children after dinner, were disagreeables at least, which Mr. John Knightley did not by any means like. He anticipated nothing in the visit that could be at all worth the purchase, and the whole of their drive to the vicarage was spent by him in expressing his discontent. A man, said he, must have a very good opinion of himself when he asks people to leave their own fireside, and encounter such a day as this, 
for the sake of coming to see him. He must think himself a most agreeable fellow. I could not do such a thing. It is the greatest absurdity. Actually snowing at this moment. The folly of not allowing people to be comfortable at home, and the folly of people's not staying comfortably at home when they can. If we were obliged to go out such an evening as this, by any call of duty or business, what a hardship we should deem it! And here we are, probably with rather thinner clothing than usual, setting forward voluntarily without excuse, in defiance of the voice of nature, which tells man in everything given to this view, or his feelings, to stay at home himself and keep all under shelter that he can. Here we are setting forward to spend five dull hours in another man's house, with nothing to say or to hear that was not said and heard yesterday, and may not be said and heard again to-morrow, going in dismal weather, to return probably in worse, four horses and four servants taken out for nothing but to convey five idle, shivering creatures into colder rooms and worse company than they might have had at home. Emma did not find herself equal to give the pleased assent, which no doubt he was in the habit of receiving, to emulate the very true, my love, which must have been usually administered by his travelling companion. But she had resolution enough to refrain from making any answer at all. She could not be complying. She dreaded being quarrelsome. Her heroism reached only to silence. She allowed him to talk and arrange the glasses, and wrapped herself up without opening her lips. They arrived, the carriage turned, the step was let down, and Mr. Elton, spruce back and smiling, was with them instantly. Emma thought with pleasure of some change of subject. Mr. Elton was all obligation and cheerfulness. He was so very cheerful in his civilities, indeed, that she began to think he must have received a different account of Harriet from what he had reached her. She had sent while dressing, and the answer had been much the same, not better. "'My report from Mrs. Goddard's,' said she presently, "'was not so pleasant as I had hoped. "'Not better was my answer.' His face lengthened immediately, and his voice was the voice of a sentiment as he answered, "'Oh, no, I am grieved to find. "'I was on the point of telling you that when I called at Mrs. Goddard's door, "'which I did the very last thing before I returned to dress.' I was told that Mrs. Smith was not better, by no means worse, very much grieved and concerned, very much grieved and concerned. I had flattered myself that she must be better after such a cordial as I knew had been given her in the morning. Emma smiled and answered, My visit was of use to the nervous part of her complaint, I hope, but not even I can charm away a sore throat. It is a most severe cold indeed. Mr. Perry has been with her, as you probably heard. Yes, I imagined. That is, I did not. He has been used to her in these complaints, and I hope to-morrow morning will bring us both a more comfortable report. But it is impossible not to feel uneasiness, such a sad loss to our party to-day. Dreadful! Exactly so! Indeed, she will be missed every moment. This was very proper. The sigh which accompanied it was really estimable, but it should have lasted longer. Emma was rather in dismay when only half a minute afterwards he began to speak of other things, and in a voice of greatest alacrity and enjoyment. What an excellent device, said he, the use of a sheepskin for carriages. How very comfortable they make it! impossible to feel cold with such precautions the contrivances of modern days indeed have rendered a gentleman's carriage perfectly complete one is so fenced and guarded from the weather that not a breath of air can find its way unpermitted weather becomes absolutely of no consequence it is a very cold afternoon but in this carriage we know nothing of the matter ha snows a little i see
"'Yes,' said John Knightley, "'and I think we shall have a good deal of it.' "'Christmas weather,' observed Mr. Elton, "'quite seasonable and extremely fortunate we may think ourselves "'that it did not begin yesterday, and prevent this day's party, "'which it might very possibly have done, "'for Mr. Woodhouse would hardly have ventured, "'had there been much snow on the ground, "'but now it is of no consequence.' This is quite the season indeed for friendly meetings. At Christmas everybody invites their friends about them, and people think little of even the worse weather. I was snowed up at a friend's house once for a week. Nothing could be pleasanter. I went for only one night, and could not get away till the very next day. Mr. John Knightley looked as if he did not comprehend the pleasure, but said only coolly, I cannot wish to be snowed up a week at Randall's. At another time Emma might have been amused, but she was too much astonished now at Mr. Elton's spirits for other feelings. Harriet seemed quite forgotten in the expectation of a pleasant party. We are sure of excellent fires, continued he, and everything in the greatest comfort. Charming people, Mr. and Mrs. Weston. Mrs. Weston, indeed, is much beyond praise and he is exactly what one values so hospitable and so fond of society it will be a small party but where small parties are select they are perhaps the most agreeable of any mr weston's dining-room does not accommodate more than ten comfortably and for my part i would rather under such circumstances fall short by two than exceed by two I think you will agree with me, turning with a soft air to Emma. I think I shall certainly have your approbation, though Mr. Knightley, perhaps, from being used to the large parties at London, may not quite enter into our feelings. I know nothing of the large parties of London, sir. I never dine with anybody. Indeed, in a tone of wonder and pity, I had no idea that the law had been so great a slavery. Well, sir, the time must come when you will be paid for all this, when you will have little labor and great enjoyment. My first enjoyment, replied John Knightley, as they passed through the sweet gate, will be to find myself safe at Hartfield again. End of chapter 13 Emma by Jane Austen Chapter 14 Some change of countenance was necessary for each gentleman as they walked into Mrs. Weston's drawing-room. Mr. Elton must compose his joyous looks, and Mr. John Knightley disperse his ill-humour. Mr. Elton must smile less, and Mr. John Knightley more, to fit them for the place. Emma only might be as nature prompted, and show herself just as happy as she was. To her it was a real enjoyment to be with the Westons. Mr. Weston was a great favourite, and there was not a creature in the world to whom she spoke with such unreserve as to his wife, not any one to whom she related with such conviction of being listened to and understood, of being always interesting and always intelligible, the little affairs, arrangements, perplexities, and pleasures of her father and herself. She could tell nothing of Hartfield in which Mrs. Weston had not a lively concern, and half an hour's uninterrupted communication of all those little matters on which the daily happiness of private life depends was one of the first gratifications of each. This was a pleasure which perhaps the whole day's visit might not afford, which certainly did not belong to the present half-hour, but the very sight of Mrs. Weston, her smile, her touch, her voice was grateful to Emma, and she determined to think as little as possible of Mr. Elton's oddities, or of anything else unpleasant, and enjoy all that was enjoyable to the utmost. The misfortune of Harriet's cold had been pretty well gone through before her arrival. Mr. Woodhouse had been safely seated long enough to give the history of it 
besides all the history of his own and isabella's coming and of emma's being to follow and had indeed just got to the end of his satisfaction that james should come and see his daughter when the others appeared and mrs weston who had been almost wholly engrossed by her attentions to him was able to turn away and welcome her dear emma emma's project of forgetting mr elton for a while made her rather sorry to find when they had all taken their places that he was close to her the difficulty was great of driving his strange insensibility towards harriet from her mind while he not only sat at her elbow but was continually obtruding his happy countenance on her notice and solicitously addressing her upon every occasion instead of forgetting him his behaviour was such that she could not avoid the internal suggestion of can it really be as my brother imagined can it be possible for this man to be beginning to transfer his affections from harriet to me absurd and insufferable yet he would be so anxious for her being perfectly warm would be so interested about her father and so delighted with mrs weston and at last would begin admiring her drawings with so much zeal and so little knowledge as seemed terribly like a would-be lover and made it some effort with her to preserve her good manners for her own sake she could not be rude and for harriet's in the hope that all would yet turn out right she was even positively civil but it was an effort especially as something was going on amongst the others in the most overpowering period of mr elton's nonsense which she particularly wished to listen to she heard enough to know that mr weston was giving some information about his son she heard the words my son and frank and my son repeated several times over and from a few other half-syllables very much suspected that he was announcing an early visit from his son but before she could quiet mr elton the subject was so completely passed that any reviving question from her would have been awkward now it so happened that in spite of emma's resolution of never marrying there was something in the name in the idea of mr frank churchill which always interested her she had frequently thought especially since his father's marriage with miss taylor that if she were to marry he was the very person to suit her in age character and condition he seemed by this connection between the families quite to belong to her she could not but suppose it to be a match that everybody who knew them must think of that mr and mrs weston did think of it she was very strongly persuaded and though not meaning to be induced by him or by anybody else to give up a situation which she believed more replete with good than she could change it for she had a great curiosity to see him a decided intention of finding him pleasant of being liked by him to a certain degree and a sort of pleasure in the idea of their being coupled in their friends imaginations with such sensations mr elton's civilities were dreadfully ill-timed but she had the comfort of appearing very polite while feeling very cross and of thinking that the rest of the visit could not possibly pass without bringing forward the same information again or the substance of it from the open-hearted mr weston so it proved for when happily released from mr elton and seated by mr weston at dinner he made use of the very first interval in the cares of hospitality the very first leisure from the saddle of mutton to say to her we want only two more to be just the right number i should like to see two more here your pretty little friend miss smith and my son and then i should say we were quite complete i believe you did not hear me telling the others in the drawing-room that we are expecting frank i had a letter from him this morning and he will be with us within a fortnight 
Emma spoke with a very proper degree of pleasure, and fully assented to his proposition of Mr. Frank Churchill and Miss Smith making their party quite complete. "'He has been wanting to come to us,' continued Mr. Weston, "'ever since September. Every letter has been full of it, but he cannot command his own time. He has those to please who must be pleased.' and who, between ourselves, are sometimes to be pleased only by a good many sacrifices. But now I have no doubt of seeing him here about the second week in January. What a very great pleasure it will be to you! And Mrs. Weston is so anxious to be acquainted with him, that she must be almost as happy as yourself. Yes, she would be, but that she thinks there will be another put-off. She does not depend upon his coming as much as I do, but she does not know the parties as well as I do. The case, you see, is—but this is quite between ourselves. I did not mention a syllable of it in the other room. There are secrets in all families, you know. The case is that a party of friends are invited to pay a visit at Enscombe in January and that Frank's coming depends upon their being put off. If they are not put off, he cannot stir. But I know they will, because it is a family that a certain lady of some consequence, at Enscombe, has a particular dislike to. And though it is always thought necessary to invite them once in two or three years, they always are put off when it comes to the point. I have not the smallest doubt of the issue. I am as confident of seeing Frank here before the middle of January as I am of being here myself. But your good friend there, nodding towards the upper end of the table, has so few vagaries herself, and has been so little used to them at Hartfield, that she cannot calculate on their effects, and I have been long in the practice of doing." "'I am sorry that there should be anything like doubt in the case,' replied Emma. "'But am disposed to side with you, Mr. Weston. "'If you think he will come, I shall think so too, for you know Enscombe.' "'Yes, I have some right to that knowledge, though I have never been at the place in my life. "'She is an odd woman. "'But I never allow myself to speak ill of her, on Frank's account, "'for I do believe her to be very fond of him.' I used to think she was not capable of being fond of anybody except herself, but she has always been kind to him, in her way allowing for little whims and caprices, and expecting everything to be as she likes. And it is no small credit, in my opinion, to him that he should excite such an affection, for though I would not say it to anybody else, she has no more heart than a stone to people in general, and the devil of a temper. Emma liked the subject so well that she began upon it, to Mrs. Weston, very soon after their moving into the drawing-room, wishing her joy, yet observing that she knew the first meeting must be rather alarming. Mrs. Weston agreed to it, but added that she should be very glad to be secure of undergoing the anxiety of a first meeting at the time talked of. For I cannot depend upon his coming. I cannot be so sanguine as Mr. Weston. I am very much afraid that it will all end in nothing. Mr. Weston, I dare say, has been telling you exactly how the matter stands? Yes, it seems to depend upon nothing but the ill-humour of Mrs. Churchill, which I imagine to be the most certain thing in the world. My Emma, replied Mrs. Weston, smiling, what is the certainty of caprice? Then, turning to Isabella, who had not been attending before, you must know, my dear Mrs. Knightley, that we are by no means so sure of seeing Mr. Frank Churchill, in my opinion, as his father thinks. It depends entirely upon his aunt's spirits and pleasure, in short, upon her temper. To you, to my two daughters, I may venture on the truth. Mrs. Churchill rules at Enscombe, and is a very odd-tempered woman, and his coming now depends upon her being willing to spare him. Oh, Mrs. Churchill! Everybody knows Mrs. Churchill, replied Isabella, 
and I am sure I never think of that poor young man without the greatest compassion. To be constantly living with an ill-tempered person must be dreadful. It is what we happily have never known anything of, but it must be a life of misery. What a blessing that she never had any children! Poor little creatures! How unhappy she would have made them! Emma wished she had been alone with Mrs. Weston. She should then have heard more. Mrs. Weston would speak to her with a degree of unreserve which she would not hazard with Isabella, and, she really believed, would scarcely try to conceal anything relative to the Churchills from her, except those views on the young man, of which her own imagination had already given her such instinctive knowledge. But at present there was nothing more to be said. Mr. Woodhouse very soon followed them into the drawing-room. To be sitting long after dinner was a confinement that he could not endure. Neither wine nor conversation was anything to him, and gladly did he move to those with whom he was always comfortable. While he talked to Isabella, however, Emma found an opportunity of saying, "'And so you do not consider this visit from your son as by any means certain. I am sorry for it. The introduction must be unpleasant, whenever it takes place, and the sooner it could be over, the better. Yes, and every delay makes one more apprehensive of other delays. Even if this family, the Braithwaites, are put off, I am still afraid that some excuse may be found for disappointing us. I cannot bear to imagine any reluctance on his side. But I am sure there is a great wish on the Churchills to keep him to themselves. There is jealousy. They are jealous even of his regard for his father. In short, I can feel no dependence on his coming, and I wish Mr. Weston were less sanguine. He ought to come, said Emma. If he could stay only a couple of days, he ought to come, and one can hardly conceive a young man's not having it in his power to do as much as that. A young woman, if she fall into bad hands, may be teased, and kept at a distance from those she wants to be with, but one cannot comprehend a young man's being under such restraint, as not to be able to spend a week with his father if he likes. One ought to be at Enscombe, and know the ways of the family before one decides upon what he can do, replied Mrs. Weston. One ought to use the same caution, perhaps, in judging of the conduct of any one individual of any one family. But Enscombe, I believe, certainly must not be judged by general rules. She is so very unreasonable, and everything gives way to her. But she is so fond of the nephew. He is so very great a favourite. Now, according to my idea of Mrs. Churchill, it would be most natural that while she makes no sacrifice for the comfort of the husband, to whom she owes everything, while she exercises incessant caprice towards him, she should frequently be governed by the nephew, to whom she owes nothing at all. My dearest Emma, do not pretend with your sweet temper to understand a bad one, or to lay down rules for it. You must let it go its own way. I have no doubt of his having, at times, considerable influence, but it may be perfectly impossible for him to know beforehand when it will be. Emma listened, and then coolly said, I shall not be satisfied unless he comes. He may have a great deal of influence on some points, continued Mrs. Weston, and on others very little and among those on which she is beyond his reach it is but too likely may be this very circumstance of his coming away from them to visit us end of chapter fourteen jane austen chapter fifteen mr woodhouse was soon ready for his tea and when he had drank his tea he was quite ready to go home and it was as much as his three companions could do to entertain away his notice of the lateness of the hour before the other gentlemen appeared.
Mr. Weston was chatty and convivial, and no friend to early separations of any sort, but at last the drawing-room party did receive an augmentation. Mr. Elton, in very good spirits, was one of the first to walk in. Mrs. Weston and Emma were sitting together on the sofa. He immediately joined them, and with scarcely an invitation, seated himself between them. Emma, in good spirits, too, from the amusement afforded her mind, by the expectation of Mr. Frank Churchill, was willing to forget his late improprieties, and be as well satisfied with him as before, and on his making Harriet his very first subject, was ready to listen with most friendly smiles. He professed himself extremely anxious about her fair friend, her fair, lovely, amiable friend. Did she know? Had she heard anything about her, since their being at Randall's? He felt much anxiety. He must confess that the nature of her complaint alarmed him considerably, and in this style he talked on for some time, very properly, not much attending to any answer, but altogether sufficiently awake to the terror of a bad sore throat, and Emma was quite in charity with him. But at last there seemed a perverse turn. It seemed all at once as if he were more afraid of its being a bad sore throat on her account than on Harriet's, more anxious that she should escape the infection than that there should be no infection in the complaint. He began with great eagerness to entreat her to refrain from visiting the sick chamber again, for the present to entreat her to promise him not to venture into such hazard till he had seen Mr. Perry and learnt his opinion. And though she tried to laugh it off and bring the subject back into its proper course, there was no putting an end to his extreme solicitude about her. She was vexed. It did appear, there was no concealing it, exactly like the pretense of being in love with her, instead of Harriet in inconstancy if real, the most contemptible and abominable, and she had difficulty in behaving with temper. He turned to Mrs. Weston to implore her assistance. Would not she give him her support? Would not she add her persuasions to his, to induce Miss Woodhouse not to go to Mrs. Goddard's, till it were certain that Miss Smith's disorder had no infection? He could not be satisfied without a promise. Would not she give him her influence in procuring it? So scrupulous for others, he continued, and yet so careless for herself. If she wanted me to nurse my cold by staying at home to-day, and yet will not promise to avoid the danger of catching an ulcerated sore throat herself. Is this fair, Mrs. Weston? Judge between us. Have not I some right to complain? I am sure of your kind support and aid. Emma saw Mrs. Weston's surprise, and felt that it must be great, at an address which, in words and manner, was assuming to himself the right of first interest in her, and as for herself, she was too much provoked and offended to have the power of directly saying anything to the purpose. She could only give him a look, but it was such a look as she thought must restore him to his senses, and then left the sofa, removing to a seat by her sister, and giving her all her attention. She had not time to know how Mr. Elton took the reproof. So rapidly did another subject succeed, for Mr. John Knightley now came into the room from examining the weather, and opened on them all with the information of the ground being covered with snow, and of it still snowing fast, with a strong drifting wind, concluding with these words to Mr. Woodhouse. "'This will prove a spirited beginning of your winter engagement, sir. Something new for your coachman and horses to be making their way through a storm of snow. Poor Mr. Woodhouse was silent from consternation. But everybody else had something to say. Everybody was either surprised or not surprised, and had some question to ask or some comfort to offer. 
Mrs. Weston and Emma tried earnestly to cheer him and turn his attention from his son-in-law, who was pursuing his triumph rather unfeelingly. "'I admire your resolution very much, sir,' said he, "'in venturing out in such weather, for of course you saw there would be snow very soon. Everybody must have seen the snow coming. I admired your spirit, and I dare say we shall get home very well. Another hour or two snow can hardly make the road impassable, and we are two carriages. If one is blown over in the bleak part of the common field, there will be the other at hand. I dare say we shall all be safe at Hartfield before midnight." Mr. Weston, with triumph of a different sort, was confessing that he had known it to be snowing some time, but had not said a word, lest it should make Mr. Woodhouse uncomfortable, and be an excuse for his hurrying away. As to there being any quantity of snow fallen, or likely to fall to impede their return, that was a mere joke. He was afraid they would find no difficulty. He wished the road might be impassable, that he might be able to keep them all at Randall's, and with the utmost good will was sure that accommodation might be found for everybody, calling on his wife to agree with him, that with a little contrivance everybody might be lodged, which she hardly knew how to do from the consciousness of there being only two spare rooms in the house. "'What is to be done, my dear Emma?' "'What is to be done?' was Mr. Woodhouse's first exclamation, and all that he could say for some time. To her he looked for comfort, and her assurances of safety, her representation of the excellence of the horses and of James, and of their having so many friends about them, revived him a little. His eldest daughter's alarm was equal to his own. The horror of being blocked up at Randall's, while her children were at Hartfield, was full in her imagination. And fancying the road to be now just passable for adventurous people, but in a state that admitted no delay, she was eager to have it settled, that her father and Emma should remain at Randall's, while she and her husband set forward instantly through all the possible accumulations of drifted snow that might impede them. "'You had better order the carriage directly, my love,' said she. "'I dare say we shall be able to get along if we set off directly, and if we do come to anything very bad, I can get out and walk. I am not at all afraid.' I should not mind walking half the way. I could change my shoes, you know, the moment I got home, and it is not the sort of thing that gives me cold. Indeed, replied he, then, my dear Isabella, it is the most extraordinary sort of thing in the world, for in general everything does give you cold. Walk home? You are prettily shod for walking home, I dare say. It will be bad enough for the horses." Isabella turned to Mrs. Weston, for her approbation of the plan. Mrs. Weston could only approve. Isabella then went to Emma, but Emma could not so entirely give up hope of their being all able to get away, and they were still discussing the point, when Mr. Knightley, who had left the room immediately after his brother's first report of the snow, came back again and told them that he had been out of doors to examine, and could answer for their not being the smallest difficulty in their getting home, whenever they liked, either now or an hour hence. He had gone beyond the sweep, some way along the Highbury Road. The snow was nowhere above half an inch deep, in many places hardly enough to whiten the ground. A very few flakes were falling at present, but the clouds were parting, and there was every appearance of its being soon over. He had seen the coachman, and they both agreed with him in there being nothing to apprehend. To Isabella the relief of such tidings was very great, and they were scarcely less acceptable to Emma on her father's account, who was immediately set as much at ease on the subject as his nervous constitution allowed. But the alarm that had been raised could not be appeased so as to admit of any comfort for him while he continued at Randall's.
he was satisfied of there being no present danger in returning home but no assurances could convince him that it was safe to stay and while the others were variously urging and recommending mr knightley and emma settled it in a few brief sentences thus your father will not be easy why do you not go i am ready if the others are shall i ring the bell yes do and the bell was rung and the carriages spoken for a few minutes more and emma hoped to see one troublesome companion deposited in his own house to get sober and cool and the other recover his temper and happiness when this visit of hardship were over the carriages came and mr woodhouse always the first object on such occasions was carefully attended to his own by mr knightley and mr weston but not all that either could say could prevent some renewal of alarm at the sight of the snow which had actually fallen and the discovery of a much darker night than he had been prepared for he was afraid they should have a very bad drive he was afraid poor isabella would not like it and there would be poor emma in the carriage behind he did not know what they would best do they must keep as much together as they could and james was talked to and given a charge to go very slow and wait for the other carriage isabella stepped in after her father john knightley forgetting that he did not belong to their party stepped in after his wife very naturally so that emma found on being escorted and followed to the second carriage by mr elton that the door was to be lawfully shut on them and that they were to have a tete-a-tete -tete drive it would not have been the awkwardness of a moment it would have been rather a pleasure previous to the suspicions of this very day she could have talked to him of harriet and the three-quarters of a mile would have seemed but one but now she would rather it had not happened she believed he had been drinking too much of mr weston's good wine and she felt sure that he would want to be talking nonsense to restrain him as much as might be by her own manners she was immediately preparing to speak with exquisite calmness and gravity of the weather and the night but scarcely had she begun scarcely had they passed the sweet gate and joined the other carriage then she found her subject cut up her hand seized her attention demanded and mr elton actually making violent love to her availing himself to the precious opportunity declaring sentiments which must be already well known hoping fearing adoring ready to die if she refused him but flattering himself that his ardent attachment and unequalled love and unexampled passion could not fail of having some effect and in short very much resolved on being seriously accepted as soon as possible it really was so without scruple without apology without much apparent diffidence mr elton the lover of harriet was professing himself her lover she tried to stop him but vainly he would go on and say it all angry as she was the thought of the moment made her resolve to restrain herself when she did speak she felt that half this folly would be drunkenness and therefore could hope that it might belong only to the passing hour accordingly with a mixture of the serious and the playful which she hoped would best suit his half-and-half -half state she replied i am very much astonished mr elton this is me you forget yourself you take me for my friend any message to miss smith i shall be happy to deliver but no more of this to me if you please miss smith message to miss smith what could she possibly mean and he repeated her words with such assurance of accent such boastful pretence of amazement that she could not help replying with quickness mr elton this is the most extraordinary conduct and i can account for it only in one way you are not yourself or you could not speak either to me or to harriet in such a manner 
command yourself enough to say no more, and I will endeavour to forget it. But Mr. Elton had only drunk wine enough to elevate his spirits, not at all to confuse his intellects. He perfectly knew his own meaning, and having warmly protested against her suspicion as most injurious and slightly touched upon his respect for Miss Smith as her friend, but acknowledging his wonder that Miss Smith should be mentioned at all, he resumed the subject of his own passion, and was very urgent for a favourable answer. As she thought less of his drunkenness, she thought more of his inconstancy in presumption, and with fewer struggles for politeness replied, "'It is impossible for me to doubt any longer. You have made yourself too clear. Mr. Elton, my astonishment is much beyond anything I can express. After such behaviour as I have witnessed during the last month, to Miss Smith, such attentions as I have been in the daily habit of observing, to be addressing me in this manner, this is an unsteadiness of character indeed which I had not supposed possible. Believe me, sir, I am far, very far from gratified in being the object of such professions. Good heavens! cried Mr. Elton. What can be the meaning of this? Miss Smith? I never thought of Miss Smith in the whole course of my existence, never paid her any attentions but as your friend, never cared whether she were dead or alive but as your friend. If she has fancied otherwise, her own wishes have misled her, and I am very sorry, extremely sorry, but Miss Smith indeed. Oh, Miss Woodhouse, who can think of Miss Smith when Miss Woodhouse is near? No, upon my honour, there was no unsteadiness of character. I have thought only of you. I protest against having paid the smallest attention to any one else. Everything that I have said or done, for many weeks past, has been the sole view of marking my adoration of yourself. You cannot really seriously doubt it. No! in an accent meant to be insinuating, I am sure you have seen and understood me. It would be impossible to say what Emma felt on hearing this, which of all her unpleasant sensations was uppermost. She was too completely overpowered to be immediately able to reply, and two moments of silence being ample encouragement for Mr. Elton's sanguine state of mind, he tried to take her hand again, as he joyously exclaimed, "'Charming Miss Woodhouse, allow me to interpret this interesting silence. It confesses that you have long understood me.' "'No, sir,' cried Emma, "'it confesses no such thing. So far from having long understood you, I have been in a most complete error with respect to your views till this moment. As to myself, I am very sorry that you should have been giving way to any feelings. Nothing could be farther from my wishes. Your attachment to my friend Harriet, your pursuit of her, pursuit it appeared, gave me great pleasure, and I have been very earnestly wishing you success. But had I supposed that she were not your attraction to Hartfield, I should certainly have thought you judged ill in making your visits so frequent. Am I to believe that you have never sought to recommend yourself particularly to Miss Smith, that you have never thought seriously of her? Never, madam, cried he, affronted in his turn. Never, I assure you. I think seriously of Miss Smith. Miss Smith is a very good sort of girl, and I should be happy to see her respectably settled. I wish her extremely well, and no doubt— there are men who might not object to— Everybody has their level, but as for myself, I am not, I think, quite so much at a loss. I need not so totally despair of an equal alliance as to be addressing myself to Miss Smith. No, madam, my visits to Hartfield have been for yourself only, and the encouragement I received— Encouragement? I give you encouragement? Encouragement? 
"'Sir, you have been entirely mistaken in supposing it. "'I have seen you only as the admirer of my friend. "'In no other light could you have been more to me than a common acquaintance. "'I am exceedingly sorry, but it is well that the mistake ends where it does. "'Had the behaviour continued, Miss Smith might have been led into a misconception of your views.' not being aware probably any more than myself of the very great inequality which you are so sensible of but as it is the disappointment is single and i trust will not be lasting i have no thoughts of matrimony at present he was too angry to say another word her manner too decided to invite supplication and in this state of swelling resentment and mutually deep mortification they had to continue together for a few minutes longer for the fears of mr woodhouse had confined them to a foot pace if there had not been so much anger there would have been desperate awkwardness but their straightforward emotions left no room for the little zigzags of embarrassment without knowing when the carriage turned into vicarage lane or when it stopped they found themselves all at once at the door of his house, and he was out before another syllable passed. Emma then felt it indispensable to wish him a good night. The compliment was just returned, coldly and proudly, and under indescribable irritation of spirits she was then conveyed to Hartfield. There she was welcomed with the utmost delight, by her father who had been trembling for the dangers of a solitary drive from vicarage lane turning a corner which he could never bear to think of and in strange hands a mere common coachman no james and there it seemed as if her return only were wanted to make everything go well for mr john knightley ashamed of his ill-humour was now all kindness and attention and so particularly solicitous for the comfort of her father as to seem if not quite ready to join him in a basin of gruel perfectly sensible of its being exceedingly wholesome and the day was concluding in peace and comfort to all their little party except herself but her mind had never been in such perturbation and it needed a very strong effort to appear attentive and cheerful till the usual hour of separating allowed her the relief of quiet reflection end of chapter fifteen emma by jane austen chapter sixteen the hair was curled and the maid sent away and Emma sat down to think and be miserable. It was a wretched business indeed, such an overthrow of everything she had wished for, such a development of everything most unwelcome, such a blow for Harriet, that was the worst of all. Every part of it brought pain and humiliation, of some sort or other, but compared with the evil to Harriet, all was light and she would gladly have submitted to feel yet more mistaken, more in error, more disgraced by misjudgment than she actually was, could the effects of her blunders have been confined to herself. If I had not persuaded Harriet into liking the man, I could have borne anything. He might have doubled his presumption to me, but poor Harriet! How could she have been so deceived? He protested that he had never thought seriously of Harriet, never. She looked back as well as she could, but it was all confusion. She had taken up the idea, she supposed, and made everything bend to it. His manners, however, must have been unmarked, wavering, dubious, or she could not have been so misled. The picture! How eager he had been about the picture! And the charade! and a hundred other circumstances, how clearly they had seemed to point at Harriet. To be sure, the charade with its ready wit, but then the soft eyes. In fact, it suited neither. It was a jumble without taste or truth. Who could have seen through such thick-headed nonsense? 
Certainly she had often, especially of late, thought his manners to herself unnecessarily gallant, but it had passed as his way, as a mere error of judgment, of knowledge, of taste, as one proof among others that he had not always lived in the best society, that with all the gentleness of his address, true elegance was sometimes wanting. But, till this very day, she had never for an instant suspected to mean anything but grateful respect to her as Harriet's friend. To Mr. John Knightley she was indebted for her first idea on the subject, for the first start of its possibility. There was no denying that those brothers had penetration. She remembered what Mr. Knightley had said to her about Mr. Elton, the caution he had given. The conviction he had professed that Mr. Elton would never marry indiscreetly, and blushed to think how much truer a knowledge of his character had been there shown than she had reached herself. It was dreadfully mortifying, but Mr. Elton was proving himself in many respects the very reverse of what she had meant and believed him, proud, assuming, conceited, very full of his own claims, and little concerned about the feelings of others. Contrary to the usual course of things, Mr. Elton's wanting to pay his addresses to her had sunk him in her opinion. His professions and his proposals did him no service. She thought nothing of his attachment, and was insulted by his hopes. He wanted to marry well, and having the arrogance to raise his eyes to her pretended to be in love, but she was perfectly easy to his not suffering any disappointment that need be cared for. There had been no real affection either in his language or manners. Sighs and fine words had been in abundance, but she could hardly devise any set of expressions, or fancy any tone of voice less allied with real love. She need not trouble herself to pity him. He only wanted to aggrandize and enrich himself, and if Miss Woodhouse of Hartfield, the heiress of thirty thousand pounds, were not quite so easily obtained as he had fancied, he would soon try for Miss Somebody Else with twenty or ten. But that he should talk of encouragement, should consider her as aware of his views, accepting his attentions, meaning, in short, to marry him, should suppose himself her equal in connection or mind, look down upon her friend, so well understanding the gradations of rank below him, and be so blind to what rose above as to fancy himself showing no presumption in addressing her. It was most provoking. Perhaps it was not fair to expect him to feel how very much he was her inferior in talent, and all the elegancies of mind. The very want of such equality might prevent his perception of it. But he must know that in fortune and consequence she was greatly his superior. He must know that the Woodhouses had been settled for several generations at Hartfield, the younger branch of a very ancient family, and that the Eltons were nobody. The landed property of Hartfield certainly was inconsiderable, being but a sort of notch in the Donwell Abbey estate, to which all the rest of Highbury belonged, but their fortune, from other sources, was such as to make them scarcely secondary to Donwell Abbey itself, in every other kind of consequence and the Woodhouses had long held a high place in the consideration of the neighbourhood, which Mr. Elton had first entered, not two years ago, to make his way as he could, without any alliances but in trade, or anything to recommend him to notice but his situation and his civility. But he had fancied her in love with him, that evidently must have been his dependence, and after raving a little about the seeming incongruity of her gentle manners and a conceited head, Emma was obliged to common honesty to stop and admit that her own behaviour to him had been so complacent and obliging, so full of courtesy and attention, 
as supposing her real motive unperceived, might warrant a man of ordinary observation and delicacy, like Mr. Elton, in fancying himself a very decided favourite. If she had so misinterpreted his feelings, she had little right to wonder that he, with self-interest to blind him, should have mistaken hers. The first error and the worst lay at her door. It was foolish, it was wrong, to take so active a part in bringing any two people together. It was adventuring too far, assuming too much, making light of what ought to be serious, a trick of what ought to be simple. She was quite concerned and ashamed, and resolved to do such things no more. "'Here have I,' said she, actually talked poor Harriet into being very much attached to this man. She might never have thought of him but for me, and certainly would never have thought of him with hope, if I had not assured her of his attachment, for she is as modest and humble as I used to think him.' Oh, that I had been satisfied with persuading her not to accept young Martin! There I was quite right. That was well done of me, but there I should have stopped, and left the rest to time and chance. I was introducing her into good company, and giving her the opportunity of pleasing some one worth having. I ought not to have attempted more. But now, poor girl! Her peace is cut up for some time. I have been but half a friend to her, and if she were not to feel this disappointment so very much, I am sure I have not an idea of anybody else who would be at all desirable for her. William Cox? Oh, no, I could not endure William Cox, a pert young lawyer. She stopped to blush and laugh at her own relapse and then resumed a more serious, more dispiriting cogitation upon what had been, and might be, and must be. The distressing explanation she had to make to Harriet, and all that poor Harriet would be suffering, with the awkwardness of future meetings, the difficulties of continuing, or discontinuing the acquaintance, of subduing feelings, concealing resentment, and avoiding eclat, were enough to occupy her in most unmirthful reflections some time longer, and she went to bed at last with nothing settled but the conviction of her having blundered most dreadfully. To youth and natural cheerfulness like Emma's, though under temporary gloom at night, the return of day will hardly fail to bring return of spirits, the youth and cheerfulness of morning are in happy analogy, and of powerful operation, and if the distress be not poignant enough to keep the eyes unclosed, they will be sure to open to sensations of softened pain and brighter hope. Emma got up on the morrow more disposed for comfort than she had gone to bed, more ready to see alleviations of the evil before her, and to depend on getting tolerably out of it. It was a great consolation that Mr. Elton should not be really in love with her, or so particularly amiable as to make it shocking to disappoint him, that Harriet's nature should not be of that superior sort, in which the feelings are most acute and retentive and that there could be no necessity for anybody's knowing what had passed except the three principles, and especially for her father's being given a moment's uneasiness about it. These were very cheering thoughts, and the sight of a great deal of snow on the ground did her further service, for anything was welcome that might justify their all three being quite asunder at present. The weather was most favourable for her, though Christmas Day she could not go to church. Mr. Woodhouse would have been miserable had his daughter attempted it, and she was therefore safe from either exciting or receiving unpleasant and most unsuitable ideas. The ground covered with snow, and the atmosphere in that unsettled state between frost and thaw, which is of all others the most unfriendly for exercise, 
every morning beginning in rain or snow, and every evening setting to freeze. She was for many days a most honourable prisoner. No intercourse with Harriet possible but by note, no church for her on Sunday any more than on Christmas Day, and no need to find excuses for Mr. Elton's absenting himself. It was weather which might fairly confine everybody at home, and though she hoped and believed him to be really taking comfort in some society or other, it was very pleasant to have her father so well satisfied with his being all alone in his own house. Too wise to stir out, and to hear him say to Mr. Knightley, whom no weather could keep entirely from them, "'Ah, Mr. Knightley, why do you not stay at home like poor Mr. Elton?' These days of confinement would have been, but for her private perplexities, remarkably comfortable, as yet seclusion exactly suited her brother, whose feelings must always be of great importance to his companions, and he had, besides, so thoroughly cleared off his ill-humour at Randall's, that his amiableness never failed him during the rest of his stay at Hartfield. He was always agreeable and obliging, and speaking pleasantly of everybody, but with all the hopes of cheerfulness, and all the present comfort of delay, there was still such an evil hanging over her in an hour of explanation with Harriet, as made it impossible for Emma to be perfectly at ease. End of chapter 16 Emma by Jane Austen Chapter 17 Mr. and Mrs. John Knightley were not detained long at Hartfield. The weather soon improved enough for those to move who must move, and Mr. Woodhouse, having as usual tried to persuade his daughter to stay behind with all her children, was obliged to see the whole party set off, and return to his lamentations over the destiny of poor Isabella, which poor Isabella, passing her life with those she doted on, full of their merits, blind to their faults, and always innocently busy, might have been a model of right feminine happiness. The evening of the very day on which they went brought a note from Mr. Elton to Mr. Woodhouse, a long, civil, ceremonious note, to say, with Mr. Elton's best compliments, that he was proposing to leave Highbury the following morning in his way to Bath, where, in compliance with the pressing entreaties of some friends, he had engaged to spend a few weeks, and very much regretted the impossibility he was under from various circumstances of weather and business, of taking a personal leave of Mr. Woodhouse, of whose friendly civilities he should ever retain a grateful sense, and had Mr. Woodhouse any commands, should be happy to attend to them. Emma was most agreeably surprised. Mr. Elton's absence just at this time was the very thing to be desired. She admired him for contriving it, though not able to give him much credit for the manner in which it was announced. Resentment could not have been more plainly spoken than in a civility to her father, from which she was so pointedly excluded. She had not even a share of his opening compliments. Her name was not mentioned. And there was so striking a change in all this, and such an ill-judged solemnity of leave-taking in his graceful acknowledgments, as she thought at first could not escape her father's suspicion. It did, however. Her father was quite taken up with the surprise of so sudden a journey, and his fears that Mr. Elton might never get safely to the end of it and saw nothing extraordinary in his language. It was a very useful note, for it supplied them with fresh matter for thought and conversation during the rest of their lonely evening. Mr. Woodhouse talked over his alarms, and Emma was in spirits to persuade them away with all her usual promptitude. She now resolved to keep Harriet no longer in the dark— 
She had reason to believe her nearly recovered from her cold, and it was desirable that she should have as much time as possible for getting the better of her other complaint before the gentleman's return. She went to Mrs. Goddard's accordingly the very next day, to under the goal the necessary penance of communication, and a severe one it was. She had to destroy all the hopes which she had been so industriously feeding, to appear in the ingracious character of the one preferred, and acknowledge herself grossly mistaken and misjudging in all her ideas on one subject, all her observations, all her convictions, all her prophecies for the last six weeks. The confession completely renewed her first shame, and the sight of Harriet's tears made her think that she should never be in charity with herself again. Harriet bore the intelligence very well, blaming nobody, and in everything testifying such an ingenuousness of disposition and lowly opinion of herself as must appear with particular advantage at that moment to her friend. Emma was in the humour to value simplicity and modesty to the utmost, and all that was amiable, all that ought to be attaching, seemed on Harriet's side but her own. Harriet did not consider herself as having anything to complain of. The affection of such a man as Mr. Elton would have been too great a distinction. She never could have deserved him and nobody so partial and kind a friend as Miss Woodhouse would have thought it possible. Her tears fell abundantly, but her grief was so truly artless that no dignity could have made it more respectable in Emma's eyes, and she listened to her and tried to console her with all her heart and understanding, really for the time convinced that Harriet was the superior creature of the two, and that to resemble her would be more for her own welfare and happiness than all that genius or intelligence could do. It was rather too late in the day to set about being simple-minded and ignorant, but she left her with every previous resolution confirmed of being humble and discreet, and repressing imagination all the rest of her life. Her second duty now, inferior only to her father's claims, was to promote Harriet's comfort, and endeavour to prove her own affection in some better method than by matchmaking. She got her to Hartfield and showed her the most unvarying kindness, striving to occupy and amuse her, and, by books and conversation, to drive Mr. Elton from her thoughts time, she knew, must be allowed for this being thoroughly done, and she could suppose herself but an indifferent judge of such matters in general, and very inadequate to sympathize in an attachment to Mr. Elton in particular. But it seemed to her reasonable that at Harriet's age, and with the entire extinction of all hope, such a progress might be made towards a state of composure by the time of Mr. Elton's return, as to allow them all to meet again in the common routine of acquaintance, without any danger of betraying sentiments or increasing them. Harriet did think him all perfection, and maintained the non-existence of anybody equal to him in person or goodness, and did in truth prove herself more resolutely in love than Emma had foreseen, but yet it appeared to her so natural, so inevitable, to strive against an inclination of that sort unrequited, that she could not comprehend its continuing very long in equal force. If Mr. Elton, on his return, made his own indifference as evident and indutable as she could no doubt he would anxiously do, she could not imagine Harriet's persisting to place her happiness in the sight or the recollection of him. There being fixed, so absolutely fixed, in the same place, was bad for each, for all three. Not one of them had the power of removal, 
or of effecting any material change of society. They must encounter each other and make the best of it. Harriet was farther unfortunate in the tone of her companions at Mrs. Goddard's, Mr. Elton being the adoration of all the teachers and great girls in the school, and it must be at Hartfield only that she could have any chance of hearing him spoken of with cooling moderation or repellent truth. Where the wound had been given, there must the cure be found, if anywhere, and Emma felt that, till she saw her in the way of cure, there could be no true peace for herself. End of chapter 17 Emma by Jane Austen Chapter 18 Mr. Frank Churchill did not come. When the time proposed drew near, Mrs. Weston's fears were justified in the arrival of a letter of excuse. For the present he could not be spared. To his very great mortification and regret, but still he looked forward with a hope of coming to Randall's at no distant period. Mrs. Weston was exceedingly disappointed, much more disappointed, in fact, than her husband, though her dependence on seeing the young man had been so much more sober, but a sanguine temper though for ever expecting more good than occurs, does not always pay for its hopes by any proportionate depression. It soon flies over the present failure, and begins to hope again. For half an hour Mr. Weston was surprised and sorry, but then he began to perceive that Frank's coming two or three months later would be a much better plan. Better time of the year, better weather, and that he would be able without any doubt to stay considerably longer with them than if he had come sooner. These feelings rapidly restored his comfort, while Mrs. Weston, of a more apprehensive disposition, foresaw nothing but a repetition of excuses and delays, and after all her concern for what her husband was to suffer, suffered a great deal more herself. Emma was not at this time in a state of spirits to care really about Mr. Frank Churchill's not coming, except as a disappointment at Randall's. The acquaintance at present had no charm for her. She wanted rather to be quiet and out of temptation. But still, as it was desirable that she should appear, in general, like her usual self, she took care to express as much interest in the circumstance, and enter as warmly into Mr. and Mrs. Weston's disappointment, as might naturally belong to their friendship. She was the first to announce it to Mr. Knightley, and exclaimed quite as much as was necessary, or, being, acting a part, perhaps rather more, at the conduct of the Churchills in keeping him away. She then proceeded to say a good deal more than she felt, of the advantage of such an addition to their confined society in Surrey, the pleasure of looking at somebody new, the gala day to Highbury entire, which the sight of him would have made, and ending with reflections on the Churchills again, found herself directly involved in a disagreement with Mr. Knightley, and to her great astonishment perceived that she was taking the other side of the question from her real opinion, and making use of Mrs. Weston's arguments against herself. "'The Churchills are very likely in fault,' said Mr. Knightley coolly, "'but I dare say he might come if he would. "'I do not know why you should say so. He wishes exceedingly to come, but his uncle and aunt will not spare him. I cannot believe that he has not the power of coming, if he has made a point of it. It is too unlikely for me to believe it without proof. How odd you are! What has Mr. Frank Churchill done to make you suppose him such an unnatural creature? I am not supposing him at all an unnatural creature in suspecting that he may have learnt to be above his connections, and to care very little for anything but his own pleasure. 
from living with those who have always set him the example of it. It is a great deal more natural than one could wish that a young man brought up by those who are proud, luxurious, and selfish should be proud, luxurious, and selfish too. If Frank Churchill had wanted to see his father, he would have contrived it between September and January. A man at his age, what is he, three or four and twenty, cannot be without the means of doing as much as that. It is impossible. That's easily said, and easily felt by you, who have always been your own master. You are the worst judge in the world, Mr. Knightley, of the difficulties of dependence. You do not know what it is to have tempers to manage. It is not to be conceived that a man of three or four and twenty should not have liberty of mind or limb to that amount. He cannot want money, he cannot want leisure. We know, on the contrary, that he has so much of both that he is glad to get rid of them at the idlest haunts in the kingdom. We hear of him for ever at some watering place or other. A little while ago he was at Weymouth. This proves that he can leave the Churchills. Yes, sometimes he can. And those times are whenever he thinks it worth his while, whenever there is any temptation of pleasure. It is very unfair to judge of anybody's conduct without an intimate knowledge of their situation. Nobody who has been in the interior of a family can say what the difficulties of any individual of that family may be. We ought to be acquainted with Enscombe, and with Mrs. Churchill's temper, before we pretend to decide upon what her nephew can do. He may at times be able to do a great deal more than he can at others. There is one thing, Emma, which a man can always do, if he chooses, and that is his duty, not by manoeuvring and finessing, but by vigour and resolution. It is Frank Churchill's duty to pay this attention to his father. He knows it is so by his promises and messages. But if he wished to do it, it might be done. A man who felt rightly would say at once, simply and resolutely, to Mrs. Churchill, Every sacrifice of mere pleasure you will always find me ready to make to your convenience, but I must go and see my father immediately. I know he would be hurt by my failing in such a mark of respect to him on the present occasion. I shall therefore set off to-morrow. If he would say so to her at once, in the tone of decision becoming a man, there would be no opposition made to his going. No, said Emma, laughing, but perhaps there might be some made to his coming back again. Such language for a young man entirely dependent to use. Nobody but you, Mr. Knightley, would imagine it possible. But you have not an idea of what is requisite in situations directly opposite to your own. Mr. Frank Churchill to be making such a speech as that to the uncle and aunt who have brought him up and are to provide for him, speaking up in the middle of the room, I suppose, and speaking as loud as he could. How can you imagine such a conduct practicable? Depend on it, Emma, a sensible man would find no difficulty in it. He would feel himself in the right and the declaration, made, of course, as a man of sense would make it, in a proper manner, would do him more good, raise him higher, fix his interests stronger with the people he depended on, than all that a line of shifts and expedients can ever do. Respect would be added to the affection. They would feel that they could trust him that the nephew who had done rightly by his father would do rightly by them. For they know, as well as he does, as well as all the world must know, that he ought to pay this visit to his father, and while meanly exerting their power to delay it, are in their hearts not thinking the better of him for submitting to their whims. Respect for right of conduct is felt by everybody. If he would act in this sort of manner, on principle, consistently, 
regularly, their little minds would bend to this. I rather doubt that. You are very fond of bending little minds, but where little minds belong to rich people in authority, I think they have a knack of swelling out, till they are quite as unmanageable as great ones. I can imagine that if you, as you are, Mr. Knightley, were to be transported and placed all at once in Mr. Frank Churchill's situation, you would be able to say and do just what you have been recommending for him, and it might have a very good effect. The Churchills might not have a word to say in return, but then you would have no habits of early obedience and long observance to break through. To him who has, it might not be so easy to burst forth at once into perfect independence, and set all their claims on his gratitude in regard at naught. He may have as strong a sense of what would be right as you can have, without being so equal, under particular circumstances, to act up to it. Then it would not be so strong a sense. If it failed to produce equal exertion, it could not be an equal conviction. Oh, the difference of situation and habit! I wish you would try to understand what an amiable young man may be likely to feel in directly opposing those whom as a child and boy he has been looking up to all his life. Our amiable young man is a very weak young man, if this be the first occasion of his carrying through a resolution to do right against the will of others. It ought to have been a habit with him by this time of following his duty, instead of consulting expediency. I can allow for the fears of the child, but not of the man. If he became rational, he ought to have roused himself and shaken off all that was unworthy in their authority. He ought to have opposed the first attempt on their side to make him slight his father. Had he begun as he ought, there would have been no difficulty now. "'We shall never agree about him,' cried Emma, "'but that is nothing extraordinary. I have not the least idea of his being a weak young man. I feel sure that he is not. Mr. Weston would not be blind to folly, though in his own son, but he is very likely to have a more yielding, complying, mild disposition than would suit your notions of man's perfection. I dare say he has, and though it may cut him off from some advantages, it will secure him many others. Yes, all the advantages of sitting still when he ought to move, and of leading a life of mere idle pleasure, and fancying himself extremely expert in finding excuses for it. He can sit down and write a fine flourishing letter, full of professions and falsehoods, and persuade himself that he has hit upon the very best method in the world of preserving peace at home, and preventing his father's having any right to complain. His letters disgust me. Your feelings are very singular. They seem to satisfy everybody else. I suspect they do not satisfy Mrs. Weston. They hardly can satisfy a woman of her good sense and quick feelings. Standing in a mother's place, but without a mother's affection to blind her, it is on her account that attention to Randall's is doubly due, and she must doubly feel the omission. Had she been a person of consequence herself, he would have come, I dare say, and it would not have signified whether he did or no. Can you think your friend behind hand in these sort of considerations? Do you suppose she does not often say all this to herself? No, Emma. Your amiable young man can be amiable only in French, not in English. He may be amiable, have very good manners, and be very agreeable, but he can have no English delicacy towards the feelings of other people, nothing really amiable about him. You seem determined to think ill of him. Me? Not at all, replied Mr. Knightley, rather displeased. I do not want to think ill of him. I should be as ready to acknowledge his merits as any other man, but I hear of none. 
except what are merely personal, that he is well grown and good looking, with smooth, plausible manners. Well, if he can have nothing else to recommend him, he will be a treasure at Highbury. We do not often look upon fine young men, well bred and agreeable. We must not be nice and ask for all the virtues into the bargain. Cannot you imagine, Mr. Knightley, what a sensation his coming will produce? There will be but one subject throughout the parishes of Donwell and Highbury, but one interest, one object of curiosity. It will be all Mr. Frank Churchill. We shall think and speak of nobody else. You will excuse my being so much overpowered. If I find him conversable, I shall be glad of his acquaintance. But if he is only a chattering coxcomb, he will not occupy much of my time or thoughts. My idea of him is that he can adapt his conversation to the taste of everybody, and has the power as well as the wish of being universally agreeable. To you he will talk of farming, to me of drawing or music, and so on to everybody. Having that general information on all subjects which will enable him to follow the lead, or take the lead, just as propriety may require, and to speak extremely well on each, that is my idea of him. And mine, said Mr. Knightley warmly, is that if he turn out anything like it, he will be the most insufferable fellow breathing. What? at three-and-twenty to be the king of his company, the great man, the practised politician, who is to read everybody's character and make everybody's talents conduce to the display of his own superiority, to be dispensing his flatteries around, that he may make all appear like fools compared with himself. My dear Emma, your own good sense could not endure such a puppy when it came to the point. I will say no more about him, cried Emma. You turn everything to evil. You are both prejudiced, you against, I for him, and we have no chance of agreeing till he is really here. Prejudiced? I am not prejudiced. But I am very much, and without being at all ashamed of it, my love for Mr. and Mrs. Weston gives me a decided prejudice in his favour. "'He is a person I never think of from one month's end to another,' said Mr. Knightley, with a degree of vexation, which made Emma immediately talk of something else, though she could not comprehend why he should be angry. To take a dislike to a young man, only because he appeared to be of a different disposition from himself, was unworthy the real liberality of mind which she was always used to acknowledge in him, for with all the high opinion of himself, which she had often laid to his charge, she had never before for a moment supposed it could make him unjust to the merit of another. End of chapter 18